Hi all. Uh, well, nice to have you here at our uh, talk, Consolidating ML Ops at Schiphol Airport. Um, before we begin, let me, uh, let me introduce myself. I am uh, Floris Hogeboom. I'm the lead data scientist of uh, Schiphol Airport. And I'll be presenting to you uh, today together with Sebastian. Uh, maybe you can uh, introduce yourself, Sebastian. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Sebastian. I'm also a data scientist at Schiphol, uh, and I'm in one of the teams uh, of uh, Flores. Thanks. So um, for today, we have a deep dive session prepared uh, for you on how we, um, as Schiphol Airport, consolidate MLOps in um, uh, all of our machine learning, um, machine learning projects. And uh, although this is a deep dive session, uh, we won't be uh, covering um, all concepts from the ground up. Uh, rather, we will uh, show how we use MLflow, show how we use Databricks for that. But we won't go into explaining what MLflow actually is and uh, uh, what it all can do for you. So we, we presume some prior knowledge to, um, uh, to MLflow. Even though if you, if you don't have that, I think you can follow along, uh, but we'll also show some uh, concrete examples, some code of how we use MLflow. So it is beneficial in that sense um, uh, to have that. Um, before we kick off and dive into the content, I would uh, briefly like to take a moment to give you a bit of a back, bit of background on um, what we're actually doing in, uh, in, in Schiphol. And um, you may be familiar with Schiphol. Schiphol is a large airport in, uh, in Europe. In fact, before um, uh, COVID hit, uh, it, was, uh, it was the third airport we, uh, we have in Europe in terms of, uh, of passenger numbers. Um, and um, probably if you travel to Asia or um, uh, uh, to Australia or uh, uh, somewhere else around the world, then you might have transferred at, um, at Schiphol. And uh, in 2019, before COVID, we um, handled around 72 million passengers, which is, of course, quite, uh, quite a bit uh, uh, also compared to, uh, to other airports. Um, and what you might not know is that Schiphol is, is not only the, the airport we have in Amsterdam, but rather the Schiphol group is um, uh, far larger, which also manages airports in, for example, Australia, um, uh, we uh, manage part of, uh, of JFK, Terminal 4. Um, so there are other airports around the world where uh, we take our knowledge, basically we have a skipple and, and apply that to, uh, to airport management as well. And one thing that makes Schiphol, so really the Amsterdam airport special, is that it's the oldest airport worldwide that is still in the same location where it was founded. So um, more than 100 years ago, Schiphol was founded as a military airfield. Um, and it is closely, um, close, closely situated near to the city of Amsterdam. And that comes with a challenge, of course, because you might imagine that 100 years ago, we didn't expect to be handling 72 million passengers at, at, our, busiest, um, at our busiest times. And um, that means that there is not a lot of room for expansion in, term, in, in Schiphol, um, uh, but still we're faced with some capacity constraints and we need to handle more aircraft, we need to handle them more efficiently. And also in this time, that's of course, if you have a lot of passengers, well, now you can imagine that um, uh, passenger numbers have declined quite a bit uh, because of COVID. But now we're faced with another challenge is how do we uh, handle a lot of people in a safe manner um, uh, across our terminal? And as an answer basically to that capacity um, uh, question, Schiphol um, a few years ago started with uh, what they call Schiphol Digital. And Schiphol Digital was an effort to use digital technology um, um, uh, to make Schiphol more, more efficient, more safe, and a better experience for passengers. And as you can imagine, data science and machine learning is a very important part in, in making that transition happen. Um, so what I would like to do before we dive into the content is give you a bit of a bit of a picture on what things we're actually um, uh, actually working on, and um, maybe the most um, um, uh, obvious thing, of course, to start with is that an airport we're dealing with operations, we're dealing with aircraft coming in, um, uh, we're dealing with a lot of different airlines uh, that come in from all over the world. And one of the things we, for example, do is we uh, try and, and predict uh, block times, and which are ex as essentially the times that an aircraft um, uh, docks at our, uh, at our gates, um, uh, starts unloading cargo, or starts disembarking passengers. 
uh, and we predict also when that aircraft will be gone uh, again. And this is, of course, a very fundamental process around the airport. So we take information like, okay, where is that, when is that flight planned, but also where is that flight situated now, for example, based on radar data, um, what do we know about weather conditions, other flights that come in, and we try to make um, such a prediction. And one of the things we use that for, um, or we lo are looking into of using that for, is, for example, optimizing gate planning or doing gate planning dynamically. Because you can imagine, at the if, if you know at a certain moment that a flight will come in for a certain gate, but um, you also see that our um, uh, predicted um, uh, departure distribution for the flight that's currently at that gate um, crosses that point where we, where we predict the next flight coming in. Um, that you might want to take action. So we're also looking at, okay, how can we make those predictions actionable and not only provide the insight, but really act on it to make our operations better. Um, another thing in the operations domain we're doing is um, uh, related to passenger flow. Um, so um, and you might not experience this as, this as a passenger, but actually our airport, and this is also what you see on the, on the picture here, is a sort of a complicated um, uh, system where you can flow through as a passenger in, uh, in, in that sense, like, like water flowing through a set of pipes with a set of nodes uh, connecting, uh, connecting them. And one of the things we do is um, we predict based on the current occupancy where we have infrared sensors all throughout the terminal to determine, okay, uh, how busy is it somewhere uh, in, 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 in a certain area right now. Um, we try to predict, um, okay, how many um, uh, passengers will there be in the coming hours? And based on that, again, we can take actions. We can, for example, um, route flights to other pairs. Um, we can um, um, decide to send passengers to a different arrival filter where they need to do a sort of different border control post, basically. Um, all to prevent crowds appearing. And especially in, 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 the, in the most recent times, this has, of course, been um, more important than ever, since it also allows us to do some form of crowd control um, to ensure that uh, everybody can keep a safe distance uh, from one another. Um, we do things for, for our passengers. So this was really operations related, but we also try and prevent, um, uh, provide insight and uh, 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 a better experience to our passengers. So one of the things you see here, for example, um, on the left uh, screenshot is an app, uh, or is part of the Skipple app, uh, where we use Wi-Fi signals um, uh, to predict these kind of heat maps for passengers, uh, where we also try and indicate, okay, where is it busy in the terminal? Where is it quiet? Where should you go if you want to have a quiet place? Um, and this is, again, something that was sparked in the, in the last year because of, uh, of COVID. And another thing we do, which is maybe not necessarily passenger related, but that's the right screenshot, is that we, for example, um, uh, for uh, people living around the airport, like I said, Schiphol is, is situated near a city. And uh, uh, that also means that there's quite a bit of disturbance, of course, of, of aircraft. Um, we try to predict, okay, how many flights can you expect overhead? Um, uh, so based on, on, on the flight patterns and the routes they fly, uh, we provide this insight where you give us your location and we uh, give you a prediction for the coming 48 hours uh, on um, uh, on the number of flights you might expect overhead. And hence then uh, we hope by that giving you a bit of insight into knowing, okay, whether you can keep your bedroom window open at night or uh, um, um, uh, or you, you can expect it to be, uh, be a bit noisy. And lastly, one thing we do is um, um, maybe more on the, on the data gathering side of things, actually. Um, uh, we uh, try to create insight into a lot of processes we have around the airport. And by that, I don't necessarily mean insight by analyzing data, but also by thinking of innovative ways how we can collect data from complicated processes. So one of the things that happens at our, uh, at our airport is, of course, a flight comes, uh, comes in and it docks at the gate but at that point it needs to be cleaned it needs to be refueled um, uh, some technical maintenance might need to be done um, uh, passengers um, uh, uh, should board and um, we have this of course not for one airline but we have this for many different airlines and many different uh, handlers so parties who basically um, uh, take care of that these uh, these actions are uh, uh, are done uh, around the aircraft. 
Um, and what we do is uh, instead of having all kinds of API integrations with all those different parties, which you can ima imagine that of course becomes really complex uh, uh, quite, uh, quite rapidly, uh, is we use camera images and we use uh, uh, computer vision uh, to detect what's currently going on uh, across the uh, uh, around the aircraft and by that we generate timestamps of all those processes and that's also the picture that you see in the top right of this um, this slide um, uh, we generate a lot of timestamps um, on when did those processes start when did those processes end also with the goal of eventually uh, providing a certain benchmark and maybe also providing an operational prediction or even um, improving that model for okay when will this flight be ready to depart again um, from this gate such that we can use it again in optimizing gate planning so a lot of things a lot of different things uh, uh, a lot of interconnected things um, and as you can imagine these are all um, use cases where uh, machine learning or uh, predictive modeling is a very important uh, aspect in um, I think I'll hand it over to you then, uh, Sebastian, to take you uh, to take us into the, the ML flow uh, part. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, uh, Floris. So uh, as Floris mentioned, we'll move in a little bit to the more in depth as to what we're actually doing on the technical side of things. So we see our goal of today is to show how we implemented machine learning operations and how that enables us to keep applying machine learning in a constantly changing environment. Because hopefully as for a showcase a little bit, there's, it's quite a dynamic environment we're dealing with at Schiphol. So first we're going to give you a little bit of background on motivation as to why we needed that ML ops. Um, then we'll head on to our, our training setup. So, and how we use ML flow and Databricks for that. Next, we'll go from, okay, we have a model, but how do we actually use it in production and how do we get it to production? And then we'll close off with, okay, we have a model in production, but how do we monitor that model and make sure that it's uh, working as we expect it? So on the motivation side, um, as mentioned, Schiphol is really a very dynamic place where we apply machine learning in. So just about every day, some physical aspect of the airport changes, which can mean that the dynamics of whatever we're trying to predict will be different. Example that's given here is the box flow. So Flores talked about passengers flowing through the airport on the terminal side, but what can happen uh, is that, for example, one of the, uh, the, the, the hallways connecting to lounges is put into maintenance. That means that the, you can't really move anymore from that place to the next or an entire lounge is put into maintenance. And that will mean that maybe models surrounding that area will use data that's no longer working or relevant. So there are some most things that we can actually capture in our models, but there still are quite a number of things that we are not able to. So those maintenance things, for example, we don't always know when they will happen, but you can also imagine that there might be some long-term incident that happens uh, that we can't really foresee and we have to adapt to to stay helpful and be able to offer insights for passengers and the operation. So keeping track and monitoring our models in production therefore was always uh, already a big task due to that ever-changing uh, circumstance and coupled with that we also quite often release model, uh, model updates because these changes occur. So for example, we want to incorporate new data sources or part of data sources uh, are put out. So once again, for example, those lounges. Um, so we want to make sure that the data we put into our models is most up to date that we can, um, not just on the training side, but especially on the inference side. But maybe a little bit of a step back and first talk about those long-term incidents that can happen. Of course, I think the big one on all of our minds um, in the recent time was COVID. Here you see an example of what that meant for Schiphol. Um, what you actually see is one of our runways, uh, Alsmeerbaan, as you can see by 36R, and it's being used as a parking lot for KLM aircraft, which is really something that's just about unheard of. And what that meant uh, for us and also for the airport, uh, of course, is that really the entire situation changed overnight and all of these, just about all of the historic data that we had no longer really applied to what we were trying to uh, predict. 
because the number of flights drops, uh, there are a lot fewer passengers than normally. So those dynamics really change. Um, and not just on the data side, uh, the fiscal aspects of the airport also changed quite a bit. So Schiphol went back to uh, what they call the core Schiphol, where they really looked at, okay, what parts do we still want to keep functional uh, to handle our demand for the airlines? Uh, and quite a number of peers, for example, were also put in kind of a, a storage mode for aircraft, um, where they parked the aircraft, um, but also moved up a lot of maintenance to make sure that, uh, well, to do the maintenance that they were already planned on doing, but they were able to do faster. So quite a number of changes all of a sudden. And um, yeah, that then falls back to, okay, but how do we actually deal with that in our models? So our training setup using MLflow is I think really quite standard. Um, on the right, you see a bit of examples on what we have. Oh, Surely, uh, shortly talk a little bit about those. But in general, uh, we have quite a strict format for all of our models. So we have a Python package that contains our library code, um, but including that, like the training application as well as the inference application. So nicely bundled together. Um, and if we want to train models, that just entails you have to install the package uh, and then using a, a fixed entry point that we have in an ML project file. Um, you can run your models and we try to keep those entry points the same uh, everywhere. So on the right is a bit of an example, um, hopefully nothing too wild, but you have your entry points, you define a number of parameters, and then you have a number of commands that you use to run your model, to train them. Um, and what then happens is that these get stored in MLflow um, along with a number of artifacts that we have created for the situation, like the one you see at the bottom right. That's a plotly plot of our predictions to make sure that uh, our data scientists are looking at the same source of truth once if we want to evaluate our models. So maybe interesting to go a little bit more into depth on that training setup. Um, Let's focus first on the, the purple square that you see. So what we do is uh, we have a custom MLflow run script. So that's at the bottom left. It's a bash script where we do our ML run. Um, and what that then does, that MLflow run, is it grabs a version of uh, our Git repo, uh, downloads that, and then along with the parameters that we have for that entry point that we use, um, these then get uploaded again to Databricks, um, where a cluster is being spun up for that job that we're doing. So it's just a training job that gets done. And then uh, all that happens in the cloud, so not locally. And once the training job is done, we store the models, the metrics, and our artifacts uh, all on MLflow. And the cluster is then turned off again. So that's really quite a neat setup uh, and quite easy because that means that we don't really have any dependencies from local users or changes that they might have accidentally made in their local code um, because it's all based on Git and that makes it also really nicely reproducible. So that's, I think, the coding side. But one important thing to note, as our smiley tells us, there is no death in machine learning because what we're actually doing, of course, is we're doing machine learning. Product, uh, predicting with models. And what that does is that deals with data. And what we as data scientists, of course, think is the most important data to use is production data, because that's the data that we uh, will actually run our models on. So there are quite a number of organizations that use the engineering DTAP flow uh, for the scientists. So they work on dev to train their model or dev environment. And like the, the square on the right shows that can work um, if it's just a dev situation from the data scientists and not the dev environment from the data engineers. Because if it's a data engineer dev environment, that can mean that the data scheme has changed or there might be a lot more noise in the data or still a bit more of an experimental setup. But if we're actually using uh, the production data, then we know at least that the, the data we're using for our own models reflects what we're going to use to predict with. So that's why we have a separate data science uh, 
dedicated data science workspace, which you see at the bottom left in the square, which is a read-only copy of the data from production. So that way we have our correct information. And then um, we have a model and we want to run inference. So there are a number of uh, types of models that we deploy, uh, specifically batch streaming and some event-based request reply. The, something maybe to give an example for batch predictions are the block time predictions that Floris talked about earlier. So when is a gate go, uh, flight going to be at the gate or leave the gate? Um, that's a job that just runs every 15 minutes uh, and does its predictions with the last known information. We also have some streaming predictions, such as what the baggage time on belt is going to be. And then lastly, we have a request reply kind of thing. So that's something that Forrest talked about for predicting the noise at your location. That's an API in Kubernetes, as an example. Um, and what's nice about this is that our way of integrating the models is for each of these deployments is more or less the same. So you don't really need a lot of custom work for those things. Um, but mostly for the rest of this talk, we're gonna focus on batch predictions. So the scheduled Databricks jobs. Yeah, so here we see a simple ML flow workflow um, as ML flow kind of wants you to work. Um, so that's a mouthful, ML flow workflow, but what you kind of see at the top left is the registered models in ML flow registry. And that should at least ideally be the basis that they talk about on what you need to work from. So what would happen ideally is that you grab a model uh, and register that in an ML flow model registry. And then depending on what workspace you're working on, you would pull that model from that environment and work with that. So you have a dedicated workspace, you do your training there, you register the model in the model registry. And then if you pull it, uh, want to use it in development, then you grab your untagged model from the registry. If you want to do it in acceptance, you get the staging version and for production, you get the production version. To give an idea, something like at the right, what you then would use. So mlflow.sklearn, you load your model, and then you do your predictions with this. Um, on the basis, this seems like a nice flow uh, to work with. However, there are a number of pitfalls uh, relating to this problem or to this way of working, I should say. And Floris is going to talk to you about what those pitfalls are and more importantly, what we did to resolve those. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sebas. Um, yeah, it's, it seems so nice, eh? um, having just this simple um, MLflow script and um, uh, then being able to deploy your models like, um, uh, like that. And it's not that this doesn't work. Um, it probably, it, it, it does work, um, but it's a bit of an oversimplification. And there are a few things that, that you um, might not realize at first when you think, hey, let's, let's deploy those, uh, those models like, uh, like this. And uh, what I want to do, I want to go through them and um, then we'll do a deep dive on, uh, on the most important one. But mo more importantly, later on, we'll also show you how we resolved, um, um, resolved those issues and overcome those pitfalls, basically. Um, so the first thing you might notice from the, the typical ML flow diagram as, uh, as the ML flow documentation uh, presents it and Sebastian presented it on, uh, on his last slide. Um, is that there's a sort of a cross environment dependency. Yeah? You have the, the, the data science environment, or at least the data science model registry, um, which you might see as a sort of a, as being in prod. And then you also have your dev and acceptance environment reading from that. And yeah, depending on the company and the, the type of industry you work in, this, this might or might not be an issue for your security department. Um, uh, personally, I, I find it a bit of a non issue. Um, uh, uh, we all have package re registries that are also crossing those environment boundaries, but it is something to realize. It's, it's also important to note here that um, um, uh, since a few uh, months, uh, Databricks is also actively now supporting that, um, uh, that shared model registry across, uh, across workspaces. So you can, um, you can do this and uh, uh, it is a feature of the Databricks uh, product. Um, so that's for the first point. The second point, which I already find more 
interesting is that this comes with a lot of runtime dependencies. And that means that if you see this in the in the setting of a batch uh, of a batch job, yeah, the moment when we fetch the model is the moment when we're making predictions. And of course, all kind of things may go um, uh, may go wrong when when you're fetching those predictions. Yeah? So you might uh, that 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 centralized model registry might not be um, uh, might not be available, or um, something might have changed in your centralized model registry. Um, uh, which um, uh, leads to those models not being um, being compatible uh, uh, anymore and hence lead to errors. So these runtime dependencies, again, they're not a big issue, but they're really something to, um, uh, um, to think about and, and to realize. And then we get to the last two points. And the last two points are, are really the, the big things which made us um, go for a bit of different workflow than that, that the typical ML flow workflow would uh, would look like. And the first being um, a, a sort of stability assumptions that this little script makes on your model and, and your code base. And if you look at that little script eh, at line 10, you see um, uh, sort of a sneaky variable called data. And that might sound, uh, um, uh, sound, sound, sound interesting, but that's of course something that needs to fit your model and needs to be generated in a way um, uh, that it matches your model. And that's where the model registry really runs into a sort of sort of problems with this setup. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll go to that a bit deeper in my, uh, in my next slide. Um, before that, let me state the last point. Hey, what, what, what's something that we identified here is that this also leads to some sort of non-atomic deployments where we don't have one source of truth, but rather uh, uh, we see there's something in the model registry that's uh, that's determining what's running. We see that there's something in Git uh, that's determining uh, what's actually the prediction job that's running, and it's also something that's hard to reason about. Um, so we before we jump jump to the solution, eh? um, because we we want to provide you with a solution, and it's it's definitely our take that MLflow is, is 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 a great product, but this is really something to think about. Let let let's. Uh, dive a bit deeper on the last two um, uh, two points. So that stability assumption on your code base. And what's really important to uh, realize is that there's a sort of a um, two versions or two definitions of what a model actually is. Um, as a data scientist, you might see your model in a very narrow sense, eh? like being only the algorithm, so something that, uh, that uh, accepts some, some input and produces some output. But you might also see the model as being a software system that predicts uh, a bit. And there's a sort of a discrepancy between those two, because especially if you take the narrow view on, on a model, so only that algorithm, then that is actually um, uh, a sort of a piece of, yeah, that, that's an algorithm, but it, it has a very strict specification, this very strict API. And not only in, in terms of, okay, I expect my input to be a data frame with these columns, which is one head, that, that's, that's a, a, a part of the API. And we're used to that kind of APIs in, in software engineering um, uh, quite a bit, of course, where uh, you have a, a set of arguments you need to parse. Well, in this, a sense you might see arguments as columns. So that's not really the issue. But also those models come with a sort of implicit um, specifications on, on, on the API um, um, of how should those features look that go in and what, what are the allowed features that, that go in. And that means that there's a very narrow coupling or a very intense coupling going on between the model that you deploy, so the, really the trained artifact in, in that sense that you produce as a data scientist, but also the inference code that that model is compatible with. And you cannot decouple those two. So you cannot say, I run every version of my model with any version of my inference code. No, those two need to be compatible. And I always like to call this feature compatibility, um, uh, uh, which, which, which means that you can um, put on the features that, 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 that you generate, you can put them into the model and they, they adhere to those, two, um, those two, two processes. But if you look at that, that script you see here, yeah, 
for all I know, uh, that model in the model registry might have changed something in the pre-processing steps so that lead up to, to that, that variable data um, that I then would also need to change in my, um, uh, uh, in, in, my, uh, in my prediction flow. And that is really something that this script for, for goes. Um, so that's really something to, to realize that deploying models is much more than only deploying the algorithm. It's also about that feature compatibility. And well, what does this mean in practice? Eh? So what might happen is um, I might uh, have a data scientist who um, uh, uh, generates a new release that doesn't use a few features. Um, I might have an older release that did use those features. Well, then with that new release, that data scientist might have the, the, the alignment with the engineers, right? And it might say, well, um, I'm, uh, uh, I have my inference code updated. But then at a certain point, if you want to revert, um, somebody might think, well, I see that model registry here. Uh, I see version 14. Let's revert to for version 14. But then you run into problems because then the inference code is bound actually to that version 16. The, uh, you want to revert to version 14. And in this case, it breaks transparently because yeah, um, um, those features were dropped, so it will error. But it might also break silently and it feels silently in that sense that it just produces predictions, but those predictions are bogus. Um, so this is really something to, to keep in mind. And in that sense, this makes that flow, that, ML, that, that, that script and, and the model um, registry UI a bit dangerous if you don't think about that. Um, the second thing I mentioned is also that, uh, and that's related to this point, um, this brings you sort of a non-atomic deployment set because you have a version in the ML flow model registry. You have a version in your, of your inference code base and together they determine what's actually the output of the inference job like you see here. And that means that there's no single point where you can say, okay, I want to go back to this version. There's always two points. There's the inference code base and the ML flow model registry where you need that you need to register to know, okay, what's the output that's that's being deployed uh, in that inference job, and that's really something to um, uh, to keep in mind and something we didn't like for our setup. So we thought, okay, how can we how can we solve this in a different way? And basically, what we came up with is we wanted to go for a setup that um, puts our CI, um, so just our um, normal software deployment flow. Um, in the lead and makes Git really the single source of truth for anything we do um, related to uh, deploying machine learning models. And um, uh, what I would like to do with you, I would like to take you through this flow and explain how we do this and also why this solves um, those pitfalls we've, um, uh, uh, we've identified. So, Let's take a hypothetical example. Eh? Um, there's a data scientist that wants to make a change to the, uh, to for example, the passenger model. Um, um, and uh, what he does, well, he adapts the code base to train his model. Uh, he stores those changes in Git, then kicks off an ML flow run uh, from Git. Um, so this is exactly the same as the training setup that Sebastian um, uh, already presented to you. Um, then the data scientist goes into, into ML flow, looks at those artifacts, judges the quality, has a bit of back and forth with his colleagues and decides, okay, is this good enough um, for me to take this model into, um, uh, into production? And if that is the case, what we then ask of our data scientists, well, um, don't merge that code yet, but we only accept merge requests on our repo that both change the code for your, um, uh, for your model, as well as change the inference code in one, in, in one go. And this is also the reason why per project, we have a sort of a mono repo, and that sounds really heavy, but actually what that means is we have a repository where we store the, um, the code we use for training and the code we use for inference in, um, uh, in the same repository. And that allows us to have MRs that if we want to merge something to master, we know that um, uh, if our training code is updated, 
um, uh, that also the inference code needs to be updated with it. And we can review that in one go. And this is really enabling for data scientists because now data scientists can take that model to production basically themselves without having to ask an engineer to update something somewhere, um, um, somewhere else. Um, so what happens? Uh, data scientist creates a merge request on that uh, uh, on that repository, and what he does is the following: he updates the code, the inference code, um, in a similar way he updated his training code. So he's still in the lead. He knows how he created those features. He knows uh, what needs to be changed on the inference code, um, and he updates a small configuration file. And what that configuration file does basically um, uh, is you see that at the bottom. Um, uh, in line two, it specifies a deployed run ID. And that is just um, a run ID of an ML flow run um, uh, that is now referenced as, okay, this is the model I want to deploy in this flow. Um, well, then our CI pipeline kicks off. We have the usual stuff, unit tests, linting, et cetera, what everybody does. Uh, but then the interesting uh, part starts. Because what we then do is we um, don't, uh, deploy a, a thing where we use that MLflow load model in, uh, uh, in, in, in basically the code that we deploy. No, rather um, uh, we use in our CI pipeline, we have a step what, what that basically fetches the model from the MLflow run and integrates that into a single deployment artifact that contains one, the inference code, and secondly, the model artifact um, that it needs to be deployed with. And that has two advantages. One, I have one artifact that can be deployed without any runtime dependency, so that's nice. Uh, I, I've basically solved my first point, uh, which was not a big point here. Eh? Um, but secondly, this also provides one artifact that we can reason about and um, uh, that contains a version of the inference code that is compatible with my model. And if I want to go back to another version, I just go back to another artifact basically. And I don't have that two sources of truth. And I've also solved the problem of feature compatibility um, by that MR flow, we, um, uh, by that merge request flow we, uh, we have. So basically what you see here at the top, uh, at, at, at the bottom right is um, you see our linting steps. Uh, then uh, in the build phase, you see something we do with the config. That's the first step. You can ignore that. Uh, but secondly, you see integrate mo uh, or integrate model, um, uh, it says. And uh, that is basically where we fetch that model from the run and we um, integrate it in our um, uh, deployment artifact. Um, and then with that deployment artifact, we can, that can be a Docker container, or in uh, this case, uh, since we agreed that we would be talking about batch, it can be uh, a Databricks job. Uh, we can schedule that. Uh, we publish all data in one go. And the nice thing about this is that now reasoning about models in production is just the same as reasoning about traditional software. Because I can use my typical environment management tools that I, uh, well, we, we use GitLab, but um, for any other Git provider, you have uh, something similar, uh, where we can keep on track, okay, what's running where. And also, if I want to revert, I can just go back to a specific version of the code base. Our CI flow will take care of um, uh, deploying the right uh, deployment artifact um, uh, job. And that also means that there's no more risk of, 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 of me reverting something that would break in production. And also here we can just follow the typical flow. Eh? So for feature branches, we can go to dev um, uh, acceptance and, uh, and production for, uh, for tax. Um, so that's, uh, that's basically, uh, basically our flow. And then I think uh, I'll hand over to you, Sebas, because um, uh, you might now ask, where's the model registry? And we do still use the model registry, but I think you can uh, better tell something about that. Yeah, thanks. Um, so the watch watchful viewer maybe already saw it uh, a few slides back on the CI pipeline. Uh, underneath deploy, there is a step called register mod, which stands for register model. So yeah, we still re uh, do use it. Um, but as mentioned uh, by Flores, we use Git as the single source of truth for whatever we're doing. So the model registry, we manage that from our CI pipeline, um, where we have a number of stages relating to the MLflow model re uh, registry stages. So 
for feature branch deployments, uh, we register a new version of the model if it doesn't yet exist. Um, if we push something to master, that means that the model in our MLflow registry will go to, uh, to staging. Um, and if we go to production, so we add tags uh, on GitLab, then uh, it gets updated to production in our M a model registry. And this is really nice because it also allows us to have a, a nice overview uh, through a user interface where we can see which model is running where, which is uh, nice. Um, but it's also clickable so that we can go to the actual runs that the models came from. So we can once again see uh, how the results looked. So the artifacts that we stored, the plots, um, and it also links back to Git, so we know which version of the code was used for that stage. The general idea is that we once again go back from that configuration file. So you see underneath the script step, uh, a step called, uh, well, the variable run ID, which references to that run ID, which is stored in our configuration. And then we have little scripts within the python.ci register model uh, that it's called, uh, and that moves that run ID through the different stages of uh, the model that's registered. So that's part of how we use the model registry. But it's also interesting to note that, of course, retraining of the models is something that generally takes quite a lot of time, uh, session, uh, especially on the scale that we're doing it. So we also thought about, OK, how can we leverage that ML project setup with that nice way of doing our runs? Um, in a way that we can automate part of that. And the way that we do that is that we use Airflow for that. So we generally kind of reuse a lot of the, the functionalities that we do for our own manual experimentations. So the whole, uh, well, add an MR, um, run a bash script for our MLflow trainer jobs. But um, we use Airflow DAX to kind of take away some of that uh, burden. So we rerun the models once a week uh, for some of our projects. And basically, we shift our train and test sets, which are added. The, the dates for those are added as parameters to our entry points, making it nice and easy to schedule those. Really important to note, we don't automatically update our models in production based on those retraining results. Um, but uh, we just take away that manual process of starting a run and all the work around it. But the decision to go live is still up to a data scientist to make sure that we don't, um, well, have situations where our models are suddenly failing or doing weird things. Um, but we still have some eyes on, uh, on our models. Maybe next about the automated retraining as well. Um, a little extension on it. So we don't just retrain the models, but we also added a step, which you can see at the top right, it's called test production model, um, to kind of compare the model that we're retraining with the one that we have in our production setting and uh, see if it's actually necessary to retrain the model um, and to put that new model up into production. So what that then does is based on that run ID, pulls that uh, model from uh, MLflow, uh, and then using a separate entry point, it tests that model against the new test set, um, which is, since it's time series, going to be further into the future, um, making sure that we don't have feature leakage in that sense. But then uh, once again, allows us to store those results and make it easy to compare the metrics of the model in production with the model uh, that we just retrained over the same test period. A small example of how that looks is at the bottom. So since there wasn't really a MLflow operator yet that did what we needed it to do, we created our own. Um, it's here, it's called the MLflow run operator. Um, and we made it in a way to, to also be able to nicely leverage it between our different teams so that they were also uh, very easily able to use that. So the workflow in that also is quite easy to use, um, where we, um, for example, use parameters in that operator, such as the entry point, which references back to that ML project entry point. You have a Git repo that you can reference to the version that you want to use. Um, 
the parameters that you want to use for your entry points, which you see here added as dictionary. So an example given here is the tag, uh, which is the tag for the run, as well as uh, your experiment ID. So where should you actually store the runs that you do uh, and the Databricks job that you uh, connection that you need to do the actual run itself. So that allows us to quite nicely and easily rerun our models and retrain them um, and take away some of them the manual work. And then lastly, uh, the monitoring of it, because, hey, we have models running in production. That's fine and dandy. But how can we actually make sure that they're still doing what we expect them to do and that they don't fail in a way that we don't really see or, for example, start drifting in performance? So what we do is uh, we take the metrics that come out of our predictive jobs um, and log those to Datadog. And on Datadog, we have a dashboard set up where we can just view the stored metrics over time for our various projects. But more importantly, we also have monitoring set up. So if, for example, data sources start going out of function, so the, the feed is getting old, for example, then a warning gets pushed to a Slack channel, uh, or if the model performances are way worse than what we expect them to be, then uh, an alarm goes off and that gets also sent to that Slack channel, allowing the data scientists or engineers to quite easily take a look at what's going on and to also be warned when it's going wrong. And then uh, if you wanna actually see what's going wrong, then we can use uh, notebooks or Databricks notebooks to dive into those anomalies. This uh, entire workflow brings quite a number of benefits for us data scientists. Uh, like Flores mentioned a number of times, it allows us as data scientists to deploy models without any support. Um, so we don't have to go to engineers whenever something goes beyond just the model itself. Um, and that's also really important since we release new versions of many of our models uh, quite often. Um, and this also then goes beyond just training on new data, but we can also quite easily extend our model by adding features or changing data sources. Uh, and then the data scientists can still make it work and also make sure that it'll work on production or at inference time, which is quite nice. So the, the workflow that we then also have with GitLab and pulling everything from GitLab into uh, MLflow um, and Databricks allows us to have it fully versioned with a single source of truth, um, which is also important because that tells us that if something works on a development environment, it'll also work on acceptance and production because we have that single deployment package. So we don't no longer really have those cross environment dependencies because our code, uh, our model and our uh, configurations are packaged in the same way, the same uh, package. And that allows us to easily revert if something breaks. So um, rather than just rolling back a model, uh, we'll also then through those GitLab tags, roll back uh, the code, the model and the configuration which are nicely coupled in that sense. So our key takeaways, uh, we think MLflow is really is a great tool, but it's not always a click and go solution. Uh, the fact that you have a standard way of storing uh, and running your models uh, along with any metrics and results surrounding it, uh, like the artifacts is really nice um, and really helps in cooperation between the teams and within the team as well. Feature compatibility um, is an important issue to keep in mind um, because your model is just a lot more than just your algorithm, especially in a changing environment such as we have at Schiphol. If physical aspects of the airport change, then we need to make sure that our models and the features that the models use change with them. Um, but having a single source of truth for that will make uh, managing those models a lot easier uh, and a lot more like managing traditional software. So all in all, this entire workflow, um, or like having a proper ML flow or ML ops workflow uh, enables us a lot of speed into getting these machine learning models to production um, because it's just a nice standard way of working. So also if we start up a new project, there's quite a lot of infrastructure that we are able to reuse, allowing us to keep nice uh, speed on that. So, 
hopefully uh, we gave you guys a good overview of what we're doing and how we're leveraging uh, Databricks ML flow in our ML ops situation. Are there any questions? <laughs>